lots of bass in that one, huh? <laughs> ah, cool, morning. Woo. It's great to be back. Grab your coffee, grab a seat, say hello to somebody. Uh, last week was Easter Sunday, and if you're new to faith or if you've been around Christianity a while, this is like the, you know, this is like the World Cup final of the Christian faith. You know, it's like the Super Bowl. It's the, it's like the biggest event. It's like the big deal. You know, I mean, Easter Sunday is the death is defeated, sitting on top of the world, nothing can stop me now. You know, it's just like you know, um, think of all the great songs that that you could sing. It's just like. You know, um, it, it's like the big moment, if you like. And, and I'm just kind of thinking, well, how does it work for us, to, like, in terms of our Christian faith? You know, like, is it just this, this boom, this big moment, and then sort of what we do next? You, you, you know, and, and I mean, the Easter, of course, the Resurrection Day is, if, if those of you who are, are not aware, it is the one event, it's the only event that shaped the Christian faith. What I mean by that is, if Jesus never came back for the dead, there would be no Christianity. So it is the event. And if you read in the New Testament, because the Bible is a collection of books, and, and some of the stuff it has in there is history books. And when you get to sort of books like Acts and onwards, and there's letters to the early church, these are like snippets, they're glimpses of history, because you're looking into how the early church got started. And you see that their message over and over and over and over again, their main message was simply, Jesus died and rose again. That was the main thing. That was the main event. It was the foundational event. It was like the, the big thing. And we believe Jesus is who he says he was because he did what he did and he came back to life. He died and he came back to life. That, that is the main thing. That is the foundation of their faith. They didn't follow Jesus because, you know, the earth flooded and Noah built a boat. They didn't follow Jesus because the earth was made in seven days, whether you believe that's how it actually physically happened or not. It's actually not, it, what, that's not the foundation of their faith. The foundation of their faith is simply an event. Jesus died and he came back to life and he made everything else make sense. And that's the one event. So if you're exploring faith, if you're trying to wrestling with things, trying to figure it out, the thing you need to look at is the life and death of Jesus because that's the foundation that inspired and was the catalyst that everything else was built on, and that's what makes sense of everything else as well. So a little caveat, if you like. Um, and, and over the next few, neat, few weeks, we're gonna be looking at this thing, uh, this new series. I gotta put my glasses on. I keep teasing myself, thinking I can do it. I'm either gonna have to print it in bigger font, you know? I think my printer's, I think something's wrong with my printer, you know, that's really what it is. <laughs> I need longer arms, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, right, okay, that's right. See, this is why the tech team are always like, man, you never, you never stick to your notes. Now you know why, huh? Um, so anyway, over the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at this. This I, I can't see any of you now. You can, like, you can all walk out of the room. I don't even know if anybody's in here. This is great. No, um, so over the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at this idea that, that this resurrection is not the finish line. The resurrection is the starting line. The resurrection affects our everyday ordinary life. This resurrected life, this resurrection day is every day. This, we celebrate the event on Easter, but the effect, the impact for us as followers of Jesus is an everyday ordinary thing, you know? And I want you to just imagine just for a moment that you were one of Jesus' first followers, that you were there, you were hanging out with him, you saw him do the things he did, you heard the things that he said, you saw how people reacted, you were there with the crowns, you ate the meals with him, you knew what his favorite sort of type of food was, uh, you could tell when he was tired. You just imagine you were there. You were like physically there with him in person. And then he dies which would destroy everything because you had given up everything to follow him at this point anyway. You'd left your jobs, you, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were on this whole journey. And then he dies, he gets arrested, betrayed, dies, killed, put to death. You think it's all over and then he comes back. You, you know, you would be sort of emotionally all over the place and understandably so, um, who wouldn't be? You know, and they thought that they thought that Jesus was going to be the one to like overthrow the Romans. 
And so then he comes back to life, of course. So once he comes back to life, they're probably thinking, yes, you know, this is it. Come on. You know what I mean? Is there anything that could get better than this? They got to think now Jesus is back from the dead. They thought they could stop him. They obviously can't. Da, 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 da. I, mean, th- I mean, this is like full on Avengers moment, right? I mean, he's got, this is like the, all of the hero films that you've ever seen where, where all of a sudden the tide turns in the battle and you're like, yes, we will actually win this thing. You know what I mean? You got, that's probably what they were feeling. Once they believed that Jesus had come back from the dead, because it took them a while to believe that, once they actually got that processed, they must have thought this is it. I mean, the only way is up. The only way is up now. I mean, the chart's going, Phew. man, what could get better than this? There's nothing that could get better than this. And I kind of used to, you know, I used to always think maybe, maybe you think the same, like if Jesus was with us in the flesh, wouldn't that be kind of cool? You know, I don't know, I always thought that when I was younger, you know, if you could actually sit beside him or talk to him or spend some time, you know, with him and you know if you had a situation or needed some advice you could actually you know go for a coffee together I mean that'd be kind of cool wouldn't it and maybe you've got people in your life who have doubts about faith and you just think man if Jesus could like sit down with them and have lunch together surely they believe it now you know if Jesus could actually just do one of his party tricks you know <laughs> and like oh wow he's real you, you know you kind of think Man, I wish, I kind of, sometimes I wish he'd be around. Or maybe sometimes you're going through something and you just think, I wish he would show up at the hospital for crying out loud. Man, why might he be here? You know, Join, be with me in this situation. You, you know, sometimes this, we want this Jesus to kind of be back. The way the disciples experienced it, they were there and they saw him in the flesh. You know, they spent time with them, everyday time. I think you kind of think, I want to, I'd like to do that as well, you know? And, and maybe you've got doubts in your life, and that would be something that you think would be helpful for, for you, you know? I mean, what could be better than having Jesus in the flesh, in the real life, with me, person, flesh? And then Jesus actually tells his friends and his followers that there is something better. There actually is something better than having me with you. And he's, he gathers his friends together, and it must have been like this. You know, he gets them all together, and I know you're all excited, and I know we're all going to, like, take over the world, and nothing's going to stop us. And, yeah, you know, can't stop me now. You know I mean? If you just hear the soundtrack going on, yeah? And they're pulling him in, and he goes, I've got to tell you. I'm going to tell you what's better What's better than everything you're experiencing right now? In two words, I'm leaving. Right? Okay. Uh, What did he say? He's breathing. He's breathing. Yes, we know you're breathing. You're still alive. Yes, we know. No, no. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going away. You will not see me anymore. You cannot come with me. I'm leaving. I'm going away. I'm leaving. Sayonara. Ciao. Goodbye. Yeah. And and the thing is, he wants to get them ready. So he's pulling them together and he goes, you need to be ready because I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. Like, how would you process that emotionally? If you'd been one of Jesus' followers, you've had these ups and downs of the emotion and the experience of seeing what was going on. I mean, how would you process that? I mean, it was, I can imagine it was a difficult conversation. And I think Jesus probably knew it would be a difficult conversation. He probably knows you're not going to understand what I'm telling you, but I need you to know this. I need to prepare you Because I'm leaving. I need to get you ready Um, because I'm leaving. You know, he's been teaching them and they've been with him and they've been seeing all the stuff he's doing. And now he's just saying, I got to get you ready because I'm going away. I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here around anymore. And they think, well, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. So you, you, okay. 
And then the, maybe they went through the catalog of all the stuff he taught them, things like turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, forgive those who hurt you, pray for those who persecute you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, judge not lest you be judged. Man, like, I mean, Jesus, like this stuff is really hard to do. It's hard to do when you're with us, but it's kind of easier when you're with us because you can encourage us and help us. You know, we can see how you're doing it. You know, we can see the way you're treating people and the way you're turning the other cheek and the way you're praying for those who are, you know, I mean, gee, man, you were dying on the cross and you're asking for forgiveness for the people that put you to death. You know, this stuff is impossible to do, but we can see you do it and that helps us. You know, this, this makes it a bit easier. But oh my gosh, like... <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I mean, you go away, how are we going to do any of this stuff? How can we be like you? How can we live the life that you called us to live? How can, we we want to do this whole new thing that you're bringing about. And then how can we even do this? Because this is just impossible. This is impossible to do, yeah? Totally impossible. Totally impossible. I mean, they sound like lovely things, don't they? Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive your enemy. Doesn't that sound like a nice thing to say? Mm. Yeah, you ever had to forgive somebody who actually hurt you on purpose? It ain't actually that easy to do. I mean, these things sound nice. Go the extra mile. Wait, ooh. do I have to? <laughs> it doesn't feel nice. It's tough stuff to do. And he knows that it's difficult. And Jesus is going to have a difficult conversation with these guys. He's going to have a difficult discussion with them. Um... And I don't know if you've ever been part of one of those sort of end of life discussions. One of those sort of sacred, holy moments, you know, where and um so Jesus is there and he it's kind of like his end of life moment discussion, because he's leaving and he knows he's going. I don't know if you saw the documentary recently on the BBC. There's some stuff about Deborah James, of course, because it's her year anniversary of, of her dying and she campaigned and she suffered with bowel cancer, remember? Um and she talks about some of the things that she did before she left. You know, she knew she was going to go. And this is like what Jesus is doing. And I remember when, when my mom was sick, you know, um, so she was at the end, you know, I mean, fought cancer for three and a bit years. And, and the, so we, we took turns going in to see her in the hospital room. And you know what it's like if you've ever experienced this where there's noises and machines and beeps and worrying and you know there's this thing called a lung which was keeping her alive which was here <laughs> you know it wasn't here yeah it was external and all these drips and monitors and stuff going on and it's all fairly uncolorful isn't it it's all kind of white and Sometimes it's like an apple color, isn't it? You know, that light apple sort of color, you know. It's funny the things that your mind remembers, isn't it? And we all, we went in as children at different times to, to see her. And I was 18 at the time. And my younger brother was 13. Now, I've got to tell you a bit about my younger brother. When he was two years old, he got banned from children's church. They're like, that kid is not coming in here ever again. You know, he was one of those kickers, biters, fighters, runners, whatever. You know what I mean? He, yeah. It, like plenty of youth group conversations, children's church conversations. We grew up in a big church. Plenty of conversations with the teachers and the youth workers about your child who just kind of caused trouble a bit. And he was 13 years old when he went in to see my mom. He said he went in to see her. And she said to him, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Because as a 13-year-old, what he took on was my mom would have been more healthy if I hadn't caused her so much pain. And that's a heavy thing for a 13-year-old to try to carry in life. Somehow you think that in your child's understanding that things as awful as cancer are somehow caused by ornery, unruly children. But when you're a child, you don't know what. 
or how things work. It was a difficult conversation. But my mom knew she was going and she knew she needed to tell him something to prepare him for the future, to get him ready for what was gonna come next because he can't live with this weight or this burden of feeling like it's my fault. It's my fault my mom's sick, it's my fault. If I hadn't caused so many problems when I was a child, if I hadn't been so unruly as a child, you know, by the way, there's hope for all of us. He runs his own company. He was a professor with tenure at the University of North Carolina. So that's hope for everybody. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but it's a difficult conversation because she's preparing him for the future. And this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is gathering his close friends in, and he knows it's an end-of-life conversation. And you can read about it. John was one of his eyewitnesses, and John wrote about it in John's chapter 13 through 17, 14 to 17. You can read about it. I encourage you to read it over the next few weeks. You can read about the conversation. And it's obvious. Jesus knows where he's going, and he knows it's over. He knows he's moving on. When you read it in hindsight, you know what's happening. But, of course, they didn't know that at the time. But he was preparing them for the future, preparing them for what was coming. He knew that they needed to know this stuff. And John records a lot of the conversation. He writes about the, the, the stuff that took place. And the interesting thing about this conversation, and, and when you read the Bible, sometimes you have to remind yourself how these stories work. This is a private conversation. When it's like Jesus on top of a mountain speaking to a multitude, that's a public conversation. But sometimes the narrative, because they're just writing down their memories and their memoirs, sometimes the conversations move from what was public to what was private. And this is in the whole books that are in the Bible, this whole section where John writes, this chapters 13 to 17, this whole memoir, this whole section is a private conversation. It's personal. It's intimate. It's with his closest friends. It's with his closest family. It's like a little boy going into a hospital room. It's private. It's personal. It's intimate. It's close. And this is the setting. This is how John records and writes about this stuff. And Jesus is getting them ready. And not only did he sort of boost their faith by telling them he's leaving, he drops a few other bombshells. I mean, listen to these. I mean, if, you, if you're not yet a Christian, this might be enough for you to say, I knew it. I should never become a Christian. Listen to the sort of stuff Jesus tells his friends. He says this. He said, the world's going to hate you. He starts singing Taylor Swift on them. And he's like, hey, it's going to hate, 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 hate. Right? I mean, he's like... I mean, what kind of like dude does this? What kind of guy like really boosts your faith? I mean, he doesn't stop there. He goes on. He goes, they're going to throw you out of the synagogue. The synagogue was like their place where they met for gathered sort of community worship. They're going to throw you out of the synagogues. Thanks, Jesus. We're going to get hated. We're going to get kicked out. And then, I mean, and then he just is like, and guess what? This one's really going to like fill you with faith. They're going to kill you. And they're going to think they're doing the right thing. Now, don't you think, thanks, Jesus. This is great. I mean, we gave everything to be with you. We thought it was all over. You came back from the dead. We've spent the last however long with you. And you're getting us ready to go? It's mad. And he's telling, the thing is, he was telling them all of this stuff before he was put to death on the cross. He knew what was going to happen. He pulls them together and he has this private, personal conversation. And then John records this other thing that he says. And Jesus is like, I didn't tell you all this stuff before. Yeah, because we would not have signed up, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, thanks. He's like, I didn't tell you this before. Because I was still with you, but I'm getting ready to leave you. In hindsight, we know what he's talking about. He's telling them, hey guys, I'm getting ready to leave you. And the longer I've talked, the sadder you've become. But you know what? It's better for you if I leave you. Dang. 
I mean, they have been through the hardest stuff. They have been through some crazy stuff. And it's hard to imagine life without Jesus. And it'd be hard to imagine that anything could be better without him. I mean, they gave up everything to be with him. They gave up everything, you know? It, it's almost like without Jesus, life isn't even worth living. That's what they would have been feeling, you know? And now he's just saying, I'm going to go, and it's better for you if I leave. How in the world are we supposed to do this impossible stuff of turning the other cheek, loving our neighbor, loving those who persecute us, forgiving people? How are we supposed to even begin to outwork and live all of this stuff? And how are we supposed to do it knowing that we're going to be hated and misunderstood and people will want to actually put us to death. We're just a bit more polite nowadays, aren't we? Because if people at your workplace find out that you're a follower of Jesus, or in your college, or at university, you're gonna get called names like bigot, or stupid, caveman, because you're obviously a Neanderthal to believe something as stupid as this. You're going to get misunderstood. And they don't kill you nowadays. We just do it in different ways. They'll cut you off from social situations. They'll not invite you to things. They'll talk about you behind your back. I mean, this is a tough gig. Isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and it's impossible. I mean, how are we supposed to do this kind of stuff? knowing that that's what you're walking into. Now you're thinking, man, I'm so glad I came to church this morning. This is like the most encouraging, <laughs> uplifting, hopeful thing I've ever had. And some of you are thinking, man, I've swerved a bullet there. I am not becoming a Christian. You'll be like, whoa, no way, not today. <laughs> no, like, this, is, this, this is what I love about the scriptures. They're just honest. They're honest people writing honest stories of their real experiences with the real person. And this is the context of what they're trying to, to process. But Jesus carries on, and he continues to speak to them. We're going to be able to dig into this over the, the next few weeks as well. But, but Jesus says, I have to go. I have to go. If I don't go, the helper won't come. He uses this word, helper. If I don't leave you, then there's no space for the helper to arrive. He tells them, I'm not leaving you on your own. John records it. He says to them, I'm not going to leave you like an orphan. He says, I, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends. There's this very personal, intimate language in this whole section of, of John. And if I don't go, the helper won't come. But if I'm able to leave, I will send a helper to you. Five times John records it. Five times. It says this. It says, I'll ask the Father and he'll send you a helper. The helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name. And when the helper comes, who I will send from the Father, and then he says, if I don't go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when the Spirit of truth comes, five times in this whole conversation with his friends and close followers, he's telling them, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to abandon you. You're not going to be an orphan. You're not going to be left on your own. You're not going to be bereft. You're going to have to, it's a big thing to process. I'm trying to get you ready for the future. And it's like a parent speaking to a child on their deathbed because they want to prepare somebody for the future. You, you might feel alone, but man, I got to, Jesus tells them over and over, you're not alone, you're not alone, you're not alone. It's going to be better for you this way, which doesn't feel good at first. It mustn't have felt good. The word that um, in Greek is translated as helper. And in, the, in Greek, there's more words f than what we have in English. For example, you could say the word love. And in, and in the Greek language, there's more than one word for love. But in our English language, we just have love. And so what happens is when we translate the, the old 
scriptures and these books that were written in different languages, you have to translate the word. And this word that, that we put as helper in English is this really old, old word, which is in Greek is parakletos, which means a paraclete. And this idea is that it's someone who's summoned to walk alongside you, someone to come alongside you, to come with you, especially because you can't do it on your own. And this is cool. This isn't in the notes. This is just an aside. The first time this word or this concept is used is in the story of Adam and Eve. And you might not believe the story of Adam and Eve is the way it happened. But Adam's on his own, and then God says, I'm going to send a helper to you. Now, the helper came along who was Eve, who came along because Adam couldn't do it on his own. It wasn't helper like hired help, subservient, appendage. It, it was actually, you can't do it on your own. And then in the Old Testament, almost 90% of the time, the way the word helper is used is to describe God. Your helper is coming. Your deliverer is coming. So when we read the word help, it's not like hired help. It's not like subservient help. It's like help because you cannot do it on your own. It's impossible to do it on your own. And this person's going to come alongside you. And they're like an enabler, an equipper, an empowerer for you to do the job that you can't do on your own, such as forgive people, love people who really annoy you and learn to live the right way. You can't do it on your own, it's impossible. It's difficult, it's so impossible. But this helper comes along to help us, not just help you like, hey, um, this is a bit too heavy, I can't do it on my own, or hey, we're moving house, can you come help me? No, it's this idea of this sustainer who comes along to beside you. And we can't fully grasp the whole idea because of our wrestling with English language. And the other aspect of this stuff is it means, um, like someone who comes before you, like if you're in, in court and you're standing before a judge and somebody comes alongside you to plead your case, let him off, let her off. This is the situation. This is what's going on. This is this, this parakletos, this person who comes to plead your case in trial. It also means um, for someone to plead your case like an intercessor. You know, sort of to canvas on your behalf. It's much more than somebody just showing up and giving you an hour of their time to help you move a couch from your front room. It's this helper who equips and enables and empowers you for life because you can't do it on your own. And Jesus didn't want his followers to feel like they were on their own. But he has to go. He has to leave. And he has to leave because he's only one person who can only be in one place. So this is just practical, but think about it like this. If Jesus was really here today, I think James, you look the most Jesus-y with that beard. So let's just imagine. <laughs> Don't let it go to your head. Um, wow, Jesus is here, guys. Like this morning, he's here. Like he's just over there. Yeah. Like, who's going to be the first one to ask him to lunch, right? Yeah. I mean, we've got a whole list of things we would love for him to be involved with. Like, I mean, like, we've got to get in there quick. I mean, I'm sure his diary is, like, booked. I mean, I can't even believe. Little Letchworth, come on. This is, just, like, incredible, right? So what would happen is if Jesus was really, really here in the real live flesh, one person in one place at one time, you'd be rushing to get him and be rushing to pull him here and pull him there and do this for me and come do this and speak to me about this and, and, and come help me in this situation and tell me where I should go for my job and tell me what course I should study at university or tell me who I should marry or all, you know, like you, we want him to come and do these things. And then sometimes it's really good things like, you know, heal this person that I love. I mean, they're suffering and they're in pain. Get them, heal them, make them better or, or help me have a better job. Like, you know, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And if he was here in the flesh, we'd treat him as a, like a commodity, like a vending machine or something. We'd pull him with us and, and we'd actually fight over him. So much so that he would say, I need to get away from the crowds. I need to just have a little bit of peace and quiet. Oh, which if you read in the Gospels, these eyewitness accounts of people that spent time with Jesus, they say, and Jesus was tired and he withdrew to a place 
Of course he was tired. People are dragging him this way and that way to do things. And if he was one person in one place, man, we'd, 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 we'd kill him by burnout or something, you know? We'd like... And so in a very practical sense, Jesus says, I have something so much better for you. So much better for you. So much better for you than me in the flesh. And I know you don't understand it right now, but there's something so much better. There's this helper who's coming, this spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is coming. I'm going to send them to you to be with you and equip you and help you. And he has to go. And this person who's coming will never leave you or never forsake you because I promised you you're not going to be left alone. You're not going to be an orphan. I'm not leaving you bereft. I'm not leaving you. And it's going to be better than a physical presence beside you because it's going to be my spirit inside you. It's not something beside you. It's my presence inside you. And this would be hard for them to understand. This is a mystery. This is kind of crazy. Let's be honest. This is a mystery. It's hard to understand. Hard to figure out. I mean, we spent our whole life thinking everything that was religious was all about special places with special people who do special things. So we had to go to temples or synagogues and there's special people called priests and only the priests speak to God, and the priests do all the work for us, and we have to do these certain things like sacrifices and rituals, and we have to perform in certain ways. Up until now, like everything else has been external, and now it's becoming internal. So much so that the temple's not sacred, you are sacred. I mean, this is, this is huge stuff. And if, 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 you, if, you're, if you're a new follower of Jesus or you're still exploring faith, thank you so much for hanging on for the ride this morning because I know we're talking about some kind of different things, but this is what Jesus is doing. It's totally changing. And this is why I said to you, the, the resurrection, Easter day, is not the finish line. It's the starting line. It's the starting line for new covenant, for new community, for new family, for a new way to do things, a new way to live, a new way to love. It's the starting line for everything else. The resurrection wasn't the finish line. It's not the end of the story. It's the start of the story. And this resurrected life is something that, that Jesus wants us all to live who are followers of Jesus. This is, this is the thing he wants us to live. And over the next few weeks, I know this is kind of just an introduction today, but over the next few weeks, we're just going to continue to sort of just dig in a little bit more on what it means to be a follower of Jesus and how he loves us so much that he's honest enough with us to tell us this is an impossible gig. Following me is going to be really hard work. Not only do you have to forgive people, who did unforgivable things. Not only do you have to love people who are unlovable, you're gonna be hated for it. You're gonna be misunderstood for it. And people will actually want to put you to death. They'll mock you in your workplaces. They'll talk about you behind your back. They will try to crush something inside you to put it down, to put it to death. I mean, isn't it cool? I mean, what other belief system puts it on the table and says to you, hey, man, this is what it's really like. It's not just all perfect life and everything works out for you. This is rough stuff. It's not easy. It's an impossible gig. But I will never forsake you. I will never leave you alone, no matter what you face in life, no matter what challenges you experience, I will never, ever, ever leave you alone. No matter what gets thrown at you, I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. You don't have to run to where I'm at and schedule an appointment and try to make sure that we can have a coffee next Wednesday at 1030. I'm with you all the time, always and forever, never, ever, leaving you 
This is why it's better for you. Better for you. Better for you. I'm not going to just be beside you. I'm going to be inside you. It's going to be better. My spirit will help you and guide you and lead you. And we're going to look at some of this stuff, as I said, over the next few weeks. And before Jesus left, this is what we're going to sort of come to land on. Jesus gave his followers a promise. And it was the promise of a person whose presence empowers. Lots of P's there. Is the promise of a person whose presence empowers. Jesus promised, not to it, not a thing, not a strange Jedi force, a person, the helper, and he will come and I will send him as a, as a person, it's personal terms. The promise of a present, of, of a person whose presence, the very fact that they're with you, will empower you for life. The promise of a person whose presence empowers you, who empowers you for a resurrected everyday life, yeah? An everyday resurrected life. Not just Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday, I empower you for an everyday resurrected Monday morning getting back into work life. A Monday morning getting ready to go back to school life. A Monday morning having to see colleagues or having to see family or having to travel or having to get on the motorway or having to do whatever you have coming up. Empowering you for an everyday ordinary resurrected life. I'm empowering you for an everyday life. I just want to, um, as we wrap up, pray and, and close. And, and I just want to say, if, if you're following us this morning, whether you're watching us online or whether you're here in the room, Jesus is just an incredible person to learn to give your life to. But we have to be honest and say, following Jesus isn't easy. It's actually impossible. And Jesus knew it was impossible. And he said, I've got a great idea. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to do it on your own. And I don't know what your journey of faith is. Maybe you felt like you've had to prove yourself or pay enough things or, or present yourself in certain ways to make sure that you've earned the right. Following Jesus has nothing to do with that. You don't have to prove yourself or perform. You just trust that Jesus will never ever leave you alone. And he proved it by putting his life on the line and he died, he came back to life. And when he came back to life, his disciples realized everything he said was true. Because if someone can die and come back to life, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> and that became, that's why the message that they preached was totally shaped by who Jesus was. And so I wanna invite you, just as you're exploring faith, Dig into it, you know. Um, Jesus loves you so much. He doesn't leave us alone. Can I just pray for you as we close? Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. God, I just thank you that you, you invite us to learn more about you and you do it in such an honest way that you, you recognize that becoming more like you is actually a really difficult and impossible thing to do, but you actually help us. You've sent a helper to equip us in our journeys. God, thank you. Thank you so much that you do not leave us alone, that you are with us, that you sustain us, and that you care for us. And God, I just pray for anyone who's still on their own journey of faith and learning more about what it means to follow you. I just pray that, that you would lead them by your spirit into truth, God. Father, we love you and we honor you and just pray for everyone here this morning, whatever they've got going on for the rest of the day, rest of the week, that you would be with them and equip them. In your name we pray, amen. So a bit of a starter today. We'll carry on over the next few weeks just digging in a little bit more about this person of the Holy Spirit who equips us to live this everyday, ordinary, resurrected life.